In My Home Library, The Book Beyond Mortal Boundaries by Annalise Scarron, is well worn, and heavily marked with a yellow highlighter. The words which follow, are those neon yellow portions of my purchased copy of Beyond Mortal Boundaries. It is very important to note that Annalie quotes and expounds scriptures throughout this book, and all her books. She verifies her teachings, with scriptures. She never says it is not important to search the scriptures. Searching the scriptures is very, important. What she is trying to open up to mankind today, is that it takes more than the searching of scriptures, to know God's word. God's word comes directly to each individual person for personal guidance. It is true that God speaks through prophets to groups of peoples or nations, or even just another person, yet each person has the voice of God within their own soul, but very few actually listen. That voice is there, unless we utterly drive God's voice out, by loving sin, more than we love his voice. Now, I begin the narration of highlights from beyond mortal boundaries. Thousands, down the ages and thousands today, have searched or are searching the scriptures thinking that in them, they will find eternal life, while they ignore Christ completely with his continual outpouring, personal information and loving direction for the constant emergencies of life. It is in that personal contact with God, as one opens up his soul to be, taught of God, that all power lies. The great power, to do, the works which Christ did, is not contained in the scriptures, but in the living, contact, with God, any individual who constantly quotes scriptures, which he has not proved by the living of them, and so obtained the powerful fulfilling of the promises, is like a man who has eaten but has not digested or assimilated the food, then spews it out, as vomit. This nearsightedness to the scriptures was a failing of mortals, even in the days of Jesus Christ upon the earth. He told how the letter killeth, that little written letter of the word. But the Spirit giveth life, or that contact with Christ, which maketh alive all things. In those ancient days they kept their eyes so centered upon the letter of the law. They failed to behold Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and so they crucified him. The wicked, not only must live under the curse of the law, they must be judged by the law, they must be ruled by the law instead of by love, and faith, and truth, which comes under the direct contact with God. When Christ came, it was again granted unto man to leave the law and to live according to the power of the promises by faith. And again, man failed to accept the promises in their literal meaning, or to exercise the faith to prove, or fulfill them. The scriptures are to be used, to prove and to verify all instructions received, and to establish truth, for no newly revealed truth will ever contradict the Bible. But the Bible does not contain all of God's words, nor can it bind God down to eternal silence, for much of it can only be fully comprehended by a continual outflowing of the divine spirit, of God, as one concentrates his energies on loving God with all his heart, the great living heart center, not just the heart organ, he will find that holy center of peace the peace that passeth understanding. This is a heavenly place to enter into, even for only a few minutes, in these days of hectic, wild, anguished living, as one continues to enter into this sacred precinct of his own heart, he will realize that as he sends out love, the love of God will begin to be poured out through him. And this love of God, which is shed forth through the hearts of the children of men, is the fruit of the tree of life. He will know that he can partake of that fruit every day of his life, 
and those divine life forces will increase within himself. As one learns to love God with all his soul, he soon trains every cell and fiber and atom of his entire being to accept love until his whole being becomes the very essence of pure divine love. One can so command his soul to receive this love flowing through his own heart that his physical body will be changed and he will become literally the very fullness of the divine love of God. This overcoming of the nether regions of the mind is the first victory to the one who begins to practice loving God with all his mind. This is also how one overcomes the evils of his life and loses every desire for sin and arrives at the point of faith where he is caught up in the power and glory of his maker. It is when love can be poured down into that low down maybe area of doubt and fear and anguish and self-pity and hatred that the precious subconscious mind will be renovated, purified and transformed. As one learns to love God with all his mind instead of himself, the darkness of that treacherous subconscious mind is cleansed and renovated. This caverned basement of accumulated selfishness and self-justification and the evils and the hypocritical self-righteousness is faced and cast out as the garbage which it is. And as the self-pity is eliminated, then there can be no darkness in him. And he becomes filled with light and truly comprehends all things, even his own past failings. The divine power of translation, for such it is, this power to be able to come and go as the wind, and to be able to do the miracles of which Nicodemus came to inquire about, are, earthly, things. They belong to this earth, for it is here that they must be applied. And since no man has sought to take hold of these dynamic truths and unspeakable powers, he is not prepared in any way to comprehend the heavenly things, so said Christ to Nicodemus. As one renovates his subconscious mind and purifies it for a higher divine functioning, he steps into a new advancement of divine preparation. One can behold the tragedy of the darkness and will realize that the desolation of the subconscious is a selected condition which many mortals choose to exist in because they learn to love the darkness rather than the light. As this condition is comprehended, the darkness and the evils can be overcome and he becomes filled with light and will comprehend all things. This is power, the power to become the least, though he is the greatest and the servant of all. In this type of high perfected service, one puts aside all desires for personal glory and acclaim, and becomes selfless in the very wonder of pure love, and deepest humility. He that is ordained of God and sent forth, the same is appointed to be the greatest, notwithstanding he is the least and the servant of all. Wherefore, he is possessor of all things, for all things are subject unto him, both in heaven and on earth, the life and the light, the spirit and the power, sent forth by the will of the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son, the divine gift of light, which includes joy and happiness and a divine understanding, comes only to those who have lifted themselves from the gutter levels of their subconscious minds, and who chase darkness from among them. Then such become purified, as the dark realms of their subconscious minds are exalted into the full functioning of power, to such the light is a living factor of eternal, constant beauty, and it becomes subject unto them. In this condition one can call forth this holy, supreme light of Christ in every dismaying condition, in every emergency, or need of devastating calamity, and they can be transmuted instantly into power and blessings. The power becomes subject, 
only to those who have earned the right to use it, by learning to control the vibrancy of their own lives in a balance of perfect, divine, Christ-like love. And this is a goal anyone can achieve who desires it, and begins to work upon themselves, instead of upon others, it can be achieved through the practice and the living, of that first and great commandment. He who purifies himself, and casts out all darkness and negation, so that he is prepared to be ordained of God and sent forth, will have all things become subject unto him, both in heaven and on earth. Each person who permits or develops and brings forth the great Christ light, or the spirit of love, will be given the glorious life energy and substance of Christ's holy essence of perfection, and the power to begin to produce the fruits that will be everlasting. These are the fruits of sharing, in which each man assumes, to a certain degree, the privilege of becoming his brother's keeper which law was rejected by Cain and all the ungodly since that period of time. To be one's brother's keeper does not mean that one's brother or neighbor is to be coddled or waited upon. It does mean, however, that we love our brother as we love ourselves, that we guard his interests as we guard our own. In this love it would be impossible to cheat anyone. We would be willing to protect our neighbor's life with our own life, if necessary, and there is no greater love than this. And this is the fruit of the tree of life. Yes, Christ is the vine of that precious tree. But man is the branches. And it is man also, who is required to hold forth those precious leaves, for the healing of the nations. These leaves contain the healing balm for the hates of the world, and for the lacks of mankind. These leaves hold the power of healing the selfishness, and the greeds, and envies, and the viciousness. These leaves contain the power of healing, and for the binding up of the wounds of those who have broken themselves, and been wounded upon the fields of their battles. And it must be remembered that the nations are made up of individuals, send love out to enfold and bless individuals, and the healing will commence. America has continually sought to bind up the wounds of those whom it has been forced to fight and conquered. The holding forth of those precious leaves of healing will find a glory of fulfillment as the nations of the earth are chastened and humbled by the hand of God. For such is the plan, and in his rebuke there will come the humility, and the appreciation, and the power to be healed. Then every precious leaf of peace, as held out, not only from the awakened nations, but from the loving hands of individuals, will be most gratefully and joyously accepted, and the healing will come. Love is released through a human heart as vibration, hate is also released through vibrations, but the vibrations of hate are destructive and deadly, and it is because of these negative, hate-filled vibrations, that this world has reached a measure of its own accumulated wickedness, and God must take a hand to save it from annihilation. Learn to open up your heart to the vibrations of this released love of God and you cannot possibly grow old, or ugly, or die. This fruit is the source of life and the power of it, and it is the spiritual food of which Christ spoke, and it is the released vibrations of God's eternal, unfailing love. This glorious information cannot be contradicted except by the most wicked of men, and it cannot possibly be disproved not even by the most depraved of human beings, but it can be proved. It can be proved by any individual who desires to make the effort, to see if God's promises can be fulfilled, by the living of the laws pertaining to them, and any who will live the laws shall know of their truth, and their power. As one steps into this higher work, he gives up nothing except the ugliness within himself. 
he gradually relinquishes his own weaknesses, dislikes, hates, prides, selfishness, his desire for self-reclaim, his greeds and his lusts. And these automatically drop away, as his feet tread the divine highway of the gods, in the pathway of his own overcoming, and no one can continue to travel this road of holiness, of love, of devotion, or of reaching for the fulfillment of perfection, without eventually reaching its glorious ending. It is impossible for anyone to keep going and not get there. The command is, let your light so shine, that others seeing your good works might glorify the Father which is in heaven. It does not say, let your experiences be shouted forth, that others hearing your words, may glorify the Father which is in heaven. God has proclaimed, my words cannot return unto me void or unfulfilled, and since God's words cannot possibly return unto him void or unfulfilled, all that is required is, for any individual who catches the meaning of even one of those holy promises, or all of them, for that matter, to hold them forth for God's fulfilling, such a one will rend the veil of unbelief through his own desire to prove, or fulfill, the promise his own heart lays hold of. They are known as gods, unto whom the word of God comes. When one has rent the veil of unbelief, overcoming the hardness of his heart, and has opened his eyes so that they are no longer half closed in blindness, that he might have eyes to see, then he will be prepared to be taught of God, and will no longer be just a plodding, grubby mortal with his vision focused only upon the earth and the things and conditions thereof, he will have opened up his soul, through faith, to the extent that God's minute instructions and powerful, loving wisdom will direct him in every act of his life. And his life will become powerful, he will begin to do the works which Christ did, and then go on to the greater works. This is the eternal promise of God to those who truly believe, not just profess to believe. But the promise is, that when man would rend the veil of unbelief, which has caused him to remain in his awful state of wickedness, then the great powers of these promises will be made manifest, in the lives of the children of men. Then, there is the promise that he who would pray continually without ceasing, Yea, unto such it shall be given to know the mysteries of God, yea unto such it shall be given to reveal things which never have been revealed, and they shall comprehend all things. Almost the same exact promise is given in these words, and if your eyes be single to my glory, your whole bodies shall be filled with light and there shall be no darkness in you and the body which is filled with light shall comprehend all things, and I will unveil my face unto him. Which fulfilled, is life eternal, accept any one of the great promises of Almighty God, or all of them, and live by them, and you will know of their power. For the power they contain will become your own, for you will be born of the Spirit, or become a translated being with a higher calling placed upon you, as you go forth in the joy and the power of eternal glory to serve, to those who have overcome their impatience, their impurities, and their every desire and inclination for sin and selfishness and self-acclaim, the gift of translation will be granted, and they will be able to come and go as the wind, and no one will know from whence they came, or whither they have gone. The admonition is not to worry about the dynamic power of translation, or to be impatient concerning your receiving it. Be only concerned about the condition of your own heart, and the power of its releasing love. Love alone is the key, therefore the admonition is to be watchful of your thoughts, and the caliber of the vibrations which you release. Cleanse yourself of all darkness and of the evils of negative, hateful, fearful, 
lustful or jealous thoughts, and the memory of those negative conditions which you have harbored unwittingly in the temple of your soul. Rend the veil of unbelief, that the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world might be confirmed and fulfilled in you. Do not let it matter to you what others have done, or have not done, or what they are doing. All things are possible to you, if you will only believe, every returning thought to the past, whether to individuals or happenings, is but sealing the past and mortality, more firmly upon the consciousness of your subconscious mind. Leave the past behind, enfolded in your awakened love and blessings. Then release it with joy, take up your abode in the great. Eternal now, which is the threshold entering into the limitless realms of the eternal, the divine realm of endless power and everlasting beauty, let every thought be upon the purification of yourself, let none of the dark memories of the past enter your mind, without enfolding them in forgiveness and love and blessing, as you perfect them in the healing light of Christ. Thus you can glorify the past, and release yourself from mortality. And you too, will become cleansed and purified. It is, given to abide in you, the record of heaven, the comforter, the peaceable things of immortal glory, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things, which maketh alive all things, that which knoweth all things, and hath all power, as one purifies the abode or realm of that powerful, divine assistant, he cleanses his subconscious mind and renovates it. Then this holy helper, or holy ghost, as the scriptures call it, can function in its dynamic fullness, it will assist you in achieving any assignment or glorify any accomplishment. It will bring culture and refinement and perfection into your life. It is impossible for anyone to master any skill or art without the help of this divine helper. It alone can bring mastery, or proficiency, or perfection, into any achievement from the playing of a musical instrument to the driving of a car, or the manipulation of any piece of office equipment or the operating of any piece of machinery. It is the divine, holy helper, that takes care of the inner functioning of the physical body, and when it is crowded out of its abode by the evils of desolate, bitter memories, and life's corroding stench of self-pity, dislikes, hates or bitterness, the body begins to age and to sicken, and to die. It is also within the power of this divine holy helper, to quicken and to renew or to make alive the physical body. This holy spirit, this divine helper, will lend its full cooperation, if only one is aware of its willingness to assist, and permits it to do so. This is its purpose and the power of its functioning, only man must acknowledge it and accept of its assistance. It must be consciously included in all one's undertakings and projects, and even in the ordinary tasks of daily living, if one's life is to go smoothly and be always under perfect control. Call this divine, holy helper by name. Give it a name, a wondrous, loving, personal name. Speak to it as though it were your most intimate, loving associate. Then make your requests or desires known and rely upon its help, fully and completely without doubting, and always give it thanks for the assistance rendered. Speak to it thus as you rejoice in its ability to hear you, and its desire to serve. Beloved Helper, quicken and renew me in mind and body and soul. I am seeking to purify the realm in which you abide in me. As I do. I ask humbly for your help. Help me to cleanse my mind, of all darkness filling it only with love and light, and beauty and perfection, and with everlasting joy. 
Always, be firm in making your requests, not domineering, just firm and grateful, and filled with praise and thanks and love, and rejoice always. Talk to this divine, holy helper, and take it into your confidence, and always remember to thank it for its help, and you will soon know that you walk with God for he will draw near to you as you draw near to him through the invited companionship of his holy helper which he has given to abide in you, this inner knowledge of closeness of the divine helper, this sacred holy ghost, is a part of the great truth. It is also the witness of Jesus Christ, and will always bear witness of him. Know the truth, the full truth, and the truth will make you free and you shall be free indeed. These books, which God has commanded me to write, contain the complete map to this exalting pathway, and to the great glory to which the pathway leads, it is a road of praise and of love and of singing gratitude. There is no darkness, nor sorrow, nor evil for Christ is the way. He is the light of it. He is the unfolding revealer of it. He is the joy of it, and as one accepts the invitation to travel the sacred road, he soon learns that these great promises have become a very part of his life, without his striving or straining, by any agonizing, self-denying misery, or anguish, as one begins to love God with all his heart, soul mind and strength he enters the true pathway of overcoming, as one reaches this point of faith, where he is wrapped in the power and glory of his maker, and is caught up to dwell with him, he can either choose to remain in that celestial realm, or return to earth to do the greater works, which Christ promised, try to imagine what the greater works would be. Then know this they are still incomprehensible to mortal minds, yet how could anyone hope to become a joint heir with Jesus Christ, or a co-heir with him, which means co-equal, unless he did do the very works which Christ did, and then went on to do even greater works. How blind the world has been, and how steeped in the dark lethargy of mortality and unbelief. Rend the veil of unbelief and you will know and be able to do the greater works, as promised. Overcome the world, even as he overcame. Only in the overcoming of the world, or the little mortal self, with its demanding claim for superiority and attention, can the straight and narrow path possibly be travelled. Glorious, wonderful God, how great thou art! Those who have eyes single to the glory of God, instead of their own importance, will eventually be filled with light and complete knowledge, as the darkness of mortality is overcome in them, then it is that God will unveil his face unto them, this is the great and last promise. In Galatians, we are informed that the law is not of faith, and that no man is justified by the law but the law was given because of wickedness. We are also told that Abraham and the patriarchs of old lived not by the law, but by the promises, through faith. Then we are informed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, that all the law is fulfilled in one word, love, and the information is plainly revealed that anyone who perfects love is no longer under the law. Or, as Christ so perfectly revealed the power and meaning of the first and second great commandments, that any who lived these two wonderful laws, had fulfilled all the laws and the prophets, so in perfecting love, one passes from under the iron rod of the law, and goes on unto perfection, as Paul admonished in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. The word meekness is such a powerful word, and so little understood, it does not mean one who is a groveling, unassertive person, cringing and fearful, 
It means one of those dynamic persons who will inherit the earth. Meekness is power, it is the power to hold one's eyes single to the glory of God, one who can glorify God under any and all conditions and circumstances, as thanks is rendered in all things. It is a person clothed in the majestic, beautiful, robe of humility as the individual seeks to glorify God, instead of his own little ugly mortal self. Seek to know God for yourselves, let God alone be your teacher. Let none block your way by their self-importance, no matter how awesome or righteous they may declare themselves to be, as one fulfills the first and second great commandments, he fulfills all the laws and the prophets. He is no longer under the bondage of the laws, which were formed for, and apply to, the wicked, he has moved up into the realm of the patriarchs, and begins to live by, and to fulfill, the powerful wonder of the principle of faith. Anyone, who thinks he is above and beyond all others, is not on the sacred holy pathway at all. He is only off in a little whirlpool of his own. Do not follow such, do not lend them your ear or your attention. Pray for them and pass on, such are not on the sacred pathway of holy glory, they are but rushing along the broad wide path, that leads to destruction and death, and realize it not. But so have thousands before them followed like sheep to the grave. No one so sacredly endowed with the power to perform miracles, ever went forth proclaiming it. Imagine Peter and John, after healing the man at the temple gate, going forth boasting about it, or imagine Christ ever boasting of either his powers or accomplishments, and so often he warned those who were healed not to boast of it. Rather he said, Go thy way and tell no man, anyone who fulfills the first and great commandment will also have fulfilled the second one, no one who loves with all his mind, could possibly think any evil unkind thought against a living soul. In fact, his mind and lips would have lost the power to hurt and wound, and his voice will be heard among the gods. Those who travel the divine highway of light live in the present, not in the past, they do not drag the past along with them in their tedious recitals of ancient memories, they leave the past behind, for he who looks back is not fit for the kingdom, if a past experience is ever repeated, it must be used only to illustrate some lesson, or to prove some point, but never in self acclaim or in boasting or deadly repetition. The dividing line between bragging self-exalting, and humble sharing, is so fine the wicked cannot possibly detect the difference, as they rush along their broad, open way to destruction. God's almighty power, can only be made manifest in those who have brought the light and the life, and the spirit and the power, into subjection as it is released through them to glorify God instead of themselves, by their fruits shall you know them. And with the fruits, the manifestation of love and humility are always made manifest, as they bear witness of God's acceptance and approval, not in words, but in power, those who live only in the past, carrying their moments of inspiration and divine direction along with them with no contact with God in the present, are truly burdened with the weight of their own worn-out stairways, as they drag each step along with them. Those who live in the future, expecting it to fulfill their dreams of perfection, their hopes of glory, their desires for acknowledgement, are also misplacing the dynamic impact of their creative powers in a far removed realm of accomplishment beyond their reach. Thank God, with all the strength of the soul for every divine whisper of comfort or instruction, or information, then go on unto perfection, as Paul directed, he who loves God with all his heart, 
soul, mind and strength, is walking with God, and he is living in the great, eternal now. In this marvelous now, do all things exist, it is within man's ability to lay hold of the best gifts, and always the power of the Almighty is bestowed in the living present, not in the dead past or in the vague, distant future, live as though you already had the complete fulfillment of your most sacred desires. This is how one believes in his heart, and doubts not. Walk with God, and you will have constant contact with him now. As one perfects love now, the gifts and the promises are fulfilled. This is the purpose for which this sacred information must be placed within this record, that all may know that it is not in the demonstrating of the self, or even of God's divine gifts, that one is recognized as a divinely appointed messenger sent of God. It is only by their fruits that the righteous are known, and the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, humility, and all the silent powers which are laid up in the center of the soul, or the kingdom of heaven, within, that are of any permanent value to him. These fruits are spiritual, and those who receive them are appointed by Almighty God to become the greatest, and only they, are acceptable to him. For shame to those who make an open, noisy display, of the holy gifts of God, as they defile them in a show of rattling brass and noisy clanging cymbals, without the pure love of Christ being first manifest in their lives. See 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Love, is the key of perfection, it is the joy and the meaning of existence. It is the glory of eternity, it is the fullness of God. And in it are contained all the other jewels of the Spirit, to him who prayeth continually without ceasing, unto such as given to reveal things which never have been revealed, yea and it shall be given unto such, to bring thousands of souls to repentance, to train oneself to pray continually without ceasing is the most marvelous blessing imaginable. This constant prayer is not a begging, God give me, prayer. It is the glorious new song of praise and love and gratitude, which can only be expressed from a living heart, in its pure perfection, it vibrates out in a radiance of ecstasy of glorious devotion, it is a divine melody of unspeakable power. It is the love of God being expressed in singing splendor, as an eternal symphony of glorious, exquisite joy. It is love made perfect, and to such it is given to know the mysteries of God, insomuch that he will be filled with light, and comprehend all things. All anyone has to do, in order to come out from under the dark burden of the make-believe, or counterfeit power, is to truly begin to live, and to fulfill that first and great commandment, as it is fulfilled, the second one will be fulfilled also, for it is impossible to love God with all one's mind, and still use the mind to think and kind thoughts, or to cling to ugly resentments or nasty little hurts. The great difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. The gifts are that which one is permitted to receive, often just to test him, even as Christ was tested in the wilderness. The fruits reveal the degree of man's worthiness as to whether he could possibly handle the power and righteousness. No man is exalted or glorified by the gifts. He may be utterly condemned by the misuse of them. One is only glorified by the fruits of the Spirit. The gifts are distributed often, just to prove who is worthy to be entrusted with the true power of heaven. One can truly possess all the gifts possible, and still be but sounding brass, and clanging cymbals. And those gifts will profit him nothing. Again. The gifts are often just for testing, 
the fruits are for glorification and for divine service. 1. Having fulfilled all the laws of mortality by perfecting that first and great commandment, is no longer under the laws of mortality. He passes beyond the earthly physical laws, and evolves into the realm of immortality. And that realm becomes his own, when one first is privileged to behold the exquisite splendor of these spiritual treasures, which he has established right within himself, he stands silent and awed, realizing he is standing in that divine holy of holies, and that it is most real. He knows with a positive knowing that he has entered the secret place of the Most High, the glorified center of his own divine, purified soul. Then a new wonder opens to that individual's understanding as he realizes fully that he is indeed the temple of the living God. Then one realizes there is still another step to be taken. He must clothe the outside of himself in the glorious radiance of those magnificent, inner jewels. And, as one steps into the kingdom within, he need go no more out. There is an ancient record of Christ, which states, he never once dwelt in the external after his illumination, in reaching this kingdom within, and laying claim to it through the perfecting of that divine gift of love one fulfills all the laws. Then automatically, he steps beyond the order or realm of even the patriarchs, he steps through and beyond the promises, into the complete fulfillment, which is perfection itself. Then, in one moment of realization, the progressing individual becomes aware that the divine key to the door to everything, that first and great commandment, has been with man from the beginning of time. Yes, it has been with man from the foundation of the world, as one clothes himself in the pure radiance of his own priceless treasures, his light begins to shine forth, so that others seeing it, or realizing that that individual carries something beyond mortal manifesting, will seek to bring forth that light within themselves, for the glory of God. It is, only as the heart of man is opened by the great love, that he can possibly enter the divine kingdom of God, and receive the unspeakable glory which God has held locked within each individual soul, and as one exerts himself to think only the most beautiful things possible, he will automatically develop that love, and will become as beautiful as possible and as one sends that love forth with all the energy of heart, soul, mind, and strength, he generates a power beyond the natural mind of man to fathom, and forever will he be clothed in the spiritual radiance, that the shame of his mortal nakedness will never appear, and though his sins were as scarlet, they will become white as snow, to him that overcometh and they will never come in remembrance before the Lord, as one lays hold of the promises through faith, and lives that first and great commandment, he is no longer under the laws of mortality, it is as one takes hold of the promises through faith, that he discovers he is traveling that straight and narrow way, and it is beautiful, it is the path of promises, and one need travel it but a very short distance before, the door to that kingdom of God is opened wide. Its reality, and its powers, and its glories become the divine possession of that individual, as he has opened his heart to, be, live. As one opens, his sealed mind, his hardened heart, and his entire being or soul to believe, the unfolding will come, and the blessings become his own. Thus he begins to travel that straight and narrow path of desiring for things beyond the grubby, mortal level, of drab existence. His exerted power to believe will open his mind to begin to desire, and his desiring is the asking, which is required for fulfillment. Yes, ask, or desire, and you shall receive, 
For everyone who asks receives, one cannot possibly ask or desire without first opening up his mind to behold, his eyes to see, and his heart to believe. It is all one and the same thing. One does not travel this road because he is afraid to die, but because he loves God. The very first miracle accomplished by love is to cast out all fear. Anything that is on the outside of man is never really his own. He can only claim definitely and permanently that which is within him, or which he himself is. He becomes the love, and the purity, and the perfection, of all that he could possibly desire in righteousness. He is those, very things, he is filled with the radiance of those inner jewels, and knows fully that all the virtues of perfection have become his own. It is then, he is able to send forth the divine radiance of those precious jewels or virtues for he himself has become divine. Christ, testified many times of the Father within who doeth the works. This Father within, of whom Christ so continually bore witness, is truly the great God, in whom we live and move and have our being. This is the contact with God within, the divine power of the Almighty that doeth the works. So Christ testified, and bore witness, of the Father within. Yet when he came forth from the tomb, after his three days and nights of teaching the spirits in prison, according to Saint Peter, and Mary dropped at his feet to embrace and worship him, he forbade her saying, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father which is in heaven. So the Father in heaven was not the Father within with whom he was in constant contact, there is truly the Father within, and, the Father which art in heaven, and both are real and in complete agreement, it is most assuredly true that there is the great God, who does fill all space, in whom we live and move and have our being, and out of which all things were made, and do exist. This is the God, who is nearer than hands and feet, the Father within. The path is so simple, a fool need not err therein, it is the road of love for God made manifest, and the love for one's fellow men so filled with forgiveness, and mercy and compassion, the self and all its negative mortal traits, are completely overcome, this straight and narrow path is the road of triumphant overcoming and praise and love and gratitude are the rhythm, and the vibration, and the music of its accomplishment. All that the Father has is yours, the love, the understanding, the power of creation, and the unspeakable glory of Godhood. The straight, a narrow way, the pathway to these dynamic promises and the door to the path is love fulfilled and made perfect, love for God and love for one's fellow men. However, he who desires to know truth, must be willing to pay the price for it, he must be willing to open up his sealed mind and his hardened heart, and to ask God for knowledge to comprehend truth. As one loves God with his whole being, it is a most natural thing to become thankful, even in all things, love is a part of gratitude. Gratitude mingled with love, embraces that refined attitude of appreciation, which releases that ecstatic vibration of singing, joyous praise, it is in the pure gift of appreciation that joy and ecstasy are fully released, and these gifts contain the deepest happiness of life. The gift of divine appreciation is the very perfecting of love and obedient acceptance of all that comes or goes in one's life, with all the powers of the soul, alerted and singing in sublime joyous ecstasy. This condition is not a dead, dull, stupid acceptance of misfortunes and evils, it is a condition of dynamic power as love is released 
This attitude holds no possibility of self-pity, it is a power which exalts every calamity, and dismay, and evil, as they are totally disarmed of their destructive forces, and all things work together for good, to those who love God. This being thankful in all things, holds no resentments, no groveling cringing attitude of abuse. It contains the dynamic powers of Godhood released through a mortal being, as he lifts himself above the grubbiness of mortal adversities, and sends his song of glory, singing out across the universe. This is power in action, those who receive this purifying glory, and are given the power to come and go as the wind, are performing the greater works, for they will be opened unto him. Such a one will be able to travel in the invisible, to appear as required or requested, to administer love and blessings and healing, according to the needs and faith of those he is sent to assist, and such service will more often be rendered without words, for my kingdom is not in word, but in power, saith the Lord, there will be no personal demonstrating or worldly acclaim. It will be a work and a benediction of outflowing, selfless love and light. These silent, glorified ministrations of the greater works upon this earth, those who advance into this perfect love and power of being able to perform the greater works, will be unannounced, and unacclaimed, and powerful. Man is then instructed to pray with all the energy of heart that he might be possessed of this great love, that it might be well with him at the last day, as one becomes possessed of this great love, that love not only fills his being it, owns, him. He becomes so filled with love, so enfolded with love, that no evil could possibly come near him. He becomes clothed in light and the divine love of God so that he can literally walk through the exploding terror of an H-bomb, and be unharmed, and no experience of destruction could be so devastating, or disastrous, as to be able to harm or touch him, and these dynamic destructions will be poured out to the extent, that the wicked will become ashes under the soles of your feet. But, if one is possessed of the great love, it will be well with him at the last day. The day of destruction, this is the promise. To pray, with all the energy of heart, simply means to center the desires of the heart upon achieving, or upon the receiving of the gift of perfect love, and all will be well with that individual. The first and great commandment automatically fulfills this desire. No one can exert himself in prayer to develop this love until he is possessed of it, or by it, who would not be exalted and glorified by its fulfilling, as one exerts his own little trickle of love, he releases the seals upon his heart, and as these are removed God begins to send his great, boundless, powerful, limitless love, through that heart as the fountains of living water. At the time of the end, the angel informed Daniel, many shall be purified and made white and tried, to see if they, like Christ, can resist the temptation to manifest their powers, and so prove that they are actually of God, as they suppose, and the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel Chapter 12, verse 10. Any negative hateful thought, every resentful desolating feeling, become a part of man also, as he permits them to take over his being. He can and will become all the ugly negation of diseases and evil possible to crawl into, by his own thinking and feeling, and encouraged habits of self pity resentments, jealousies, fears or greeds and lusts, which he may nourish within himself, man is what he thinks, and feels. Such is man's power to mold himself, 
he can also remold himself into a radiant sun of light, traveling a highway of exalting splendor, a path of purification of the heart, without bigotry or stress or striving or condemning. Work on yourself, and you will become the greatest miracle of all. In the great, heartbreaking emergencies, learn to be still, for only a moment, as you quietly whisper to the great and all-powerful God, the almighty creator of heaven and of earth, your own loving Father. Dear God, I love you, I love you. I love you. And, no one in existence, no matter what their mental, emotional or vibrational level, can remain on their present level who begins to whisper, within himself. Dear God, I love you. I love you. I love you. You will, almost in the instant of your released pain, begin to receive comfort and assistance, and wisdom and knowledge and divine help will be sent to assist you in straightening out the disasters, and all things will begin to work together for your good, and you will reach a place where nothing in all existence can disturb you or distress you, for you will walk in the released power of Almighty God. And soon you will realize, that you are the greatest miracle of all, you will live with miracles following at your heels. You may not always comprehend the full extent of such power, as you pass along your way, giving out praise and love and blessing in a silence of unspoken words, but miracles will be there, unannounced and unacclaimed, and so naturally brought about, there will be no need of rattling brass or of clanging cymbals, to bear witness of God's great powers. These are the greater works unheralded and unacclaimed. The creative force of light is every man's to use, even as it is God's. It is man's to command and to form into atoms, as it is drawn into the pattern of his dreamings, for out of these infinitesimal rays of living, cosmic light, which fill the universe, are atoms formed. Within each atom is contained the love, the intelligence, and the power of God. Atoms are the building blocks of all that is visible. Atoms, created from the rays of living light, are gathered into form by thought, until reality becomes apparent to the most ordinary and dense of men, as their lowered vision beholds only the dust. And so, to each man, God gave a mind with which to think, to dream, to form the patterns of his inner musings, by the living force and energy of his own brooding. And those thoughts will take form, to flourish or to die, according to the attention with which one's garden of desire is nourished and sustained, such as the power of that divine tree of good or evil, which each man holds within the center of his being, which is his own Eden, his soul. Each man, by the selection of his thoughts, can bring forth an abundance of all that his thoughts embrace. This is the tree of creation, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This the tree of which man is a branch, and each man produces and brings forth either the good or the evil of his own thinking, and some produce a contaminated mixture of both love and the hates of their own creating and each man will be judged by his idle thoughts. The tree of knowledge of good or evil is also the tree of death, for by its roots came death into the world, and every living soul is fed and nourished upon the fruit of his own thinking, and he who thinks only filthy, angry, evil or selfish, greedy, defiled thoughts, is required to subsist upon the evil of his own corrupted, degenerate, contaminated poisons of lusts, dishonesties or selfishness, his hates and evils, is feeding upon deadly pollution. And he will die, for this is the tree that brought death into the world, 
and is still bringing death into the world, for each individual who brings forth its evils, it is entirely according to each man's thinking, as to which type of fruit he will bring forth, through the power or the use he makes of his golden gift, the mind, man can change his thinking habits, and thus not only change his life, but glorify it, the law itself is justice. The power to be able to change one's thought habits, is mercy. If, one is filled with light so that he begins to comprehend all things, he will first of all comprehend and know fully, the law which brings about all conditions, either good or evil, according to the inner vision, or according to the thoughts he holds within his mind, he will comprehend the full meaning of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, he will understand fully and with reverent awe, that he is a branch of the tree, and is therefore responsible for the type of fruit he produces, as one understands the dynamic wonder of that tree of knowledge, and produces only the good of that glorious tree, he becomes powerful, he fulfills completely the laws of Christ, in a splendor of divine love and gratitude and exulting praise, he becomes purified and is cleansed from all sin. He becomes exalted, and naturally, and without effort or striving, he overcomes death, the last enemy, according to the promises of Jesus Christ. And so, that great mystery, or mist, tree, that has been veiled in the mist of the ages, becomes fully revealed in its breathtaking glory as the, tree of life, also, it is the veil or mist, that has enshrouded this tree down the centuries, that must now be rent. In this divine control of thoughts and feelings, and perfect adoration, love will pour out through every living cell of the soul and the body, and the fruit of the tree of life is the love of God, which is shed forth through the hearts of the children of men, and man's heart is prepared for this glorious experience, as he trains his mind to think only the most beautiful things possible. The law of gravity, and the law of mortality, and the law of death, are one and the same law, this physical law is the law of seeking for one's own, the higher law as revealed by Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, is the law of charity, which seeketh not its own, in breaking the lower law of gravity and of mortality, one usually goes a step lower and seeks for more than is his own, or for more than he is rightfully entitled to. He grasps that which he has no right to, through dishonest procedures or greed. When the earthly law of gravity is broken, the burden of its curse follows beyond the grave, and into eternity, those who break this mortal law are doubly subject unto death, which is the fulfilled law of earth, and mortality, and gravity, or the grave. He who becomes a follower will of necessity advance until he becomes a leader, this is the law of progression and of responsibility, and of service, it is the divine law of fulfillment, though one may not even give it a thought, for there are those who desire to serve for pure love, love for God, love for their fellow men, and the love that requires action and fulfillment, in a devotion of self-sacrifice. Only those who have advanced to the point where they love God above all else, are capable of holding within them the desire to serve Him completely, and those who wish to serve Him, must seek first to know His will. They truly wish to train their own minds to be able to hear, that they might speak no word save He commands it, or perform no act except He reveals it. This is the Christ type of service and only through such service is it possible to begin to do the works which he did, for love and joy are the power of its perfecting. Be it known, this higher type of service is accomplished in humility, and not by flinging oneself from the temple pinnacle.
all things, are fulfilled through growth and desire. Even Christ, so we are informed, grew from grace to grace. Growth can only come through living the laws, not just through believing them. Be ye therefore doers of the word, not hearers only, thus deceiving your own selves. To be a doer of any law, one must not only accept it, but he must fulfill it, by performing it. This entails the practice of actually experiencing all that is connected with the power of fulfillment of that law, whatever it may be, one must experience growth by fulfilling the laws pertaining to it, and this takes a great deal of living. And only, after one has been tested and tried in all things, will he find his calling and election made sure. Every lesson one learns, along this upward path, must needs be followed by a test, to see if that individual is determined to serve God at all hazards, and that word hazards is a big word, it can include many things. And it must be remembered, that God never gives a commandment save he prepares the way for its fulfillment, it is the love, and the willingness alone that is being tested, after all, and to those who love greatly, every test is but a divine and holy privilege, let the wonder of his comfort enter your hearts in these holy words, your peace was prepared for you, before ever your war, or testing, was, Odes of Solomon, Ode 8, Verse 8. Nothing is impossible either to endure, to overcome, or to achieve. No testing is greater than one's strength and endurance, if he meets those difficulties with pure adoration in his soul, there is no testing or law or condition that cannot be glorified and exalted, within man is the power of transmutation, and glorification, this higher law is one of giving and of forgiving, of relinquishing and of blessing. It is the pathway of love and of praising and of giving thanks in all things. It is the law of rejoicing even at what might appear to be a violent setback. And, this sacred path of advancing and of refining and of purifying, is the path one must travel, willingly, if one travels it in joy and gratitude the tests are not even felt as tests or trials or impossible burdens. They are the divine opportunities of continual advancement. Never allow the magnitude of this glorious pathway to overwhelm you, it is travelled by taking just one step at a time. In travelling it thus, the way is easy and the journey a joy, and it is only as one joyously travels each step that he ascends unto the heights. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 8 verses 5 and 6, Paul revealed, For though there be those that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Yes. There are lords many and gods many. But no matter how high we ascend, our own gracious Father and our beloved Saviour, Jesus Christ, will always be ahead of us, leading us ever onward and upward as they too, continue to ascend, and progress, along that glorified spiral of eternity. In the ancient Hebrew, the title for deity was Elohim. For man is not without the woman or woman without the man, in the Lord, or when they reach the state of Godhood, the only things that really matter in eternity, is not what one knows, or has, or professes to be, but only what he is. This straight, a narrow way which leads to life eternal, is the one in which one need never die, but to live forever without a goal, or a purpose is meaningless nonsense. It is not the meek, who are the timid, groveling, 
cringing weaklings, but the fearful, the fearful can never accept the divine challenge of Jesus, Christ, Son of the living God, to prove all things. They can prove nothing, not even their own erroneous beliefs, by shouting louder than anyone else, they seal their ears and their minds to any new information, or divine enlightenment, they do not even have the courage to look at one single new truth, or to seek to compare the light with their own darkness. Truth itself, is the greatest reward in all existence, and those who seek to prove any idea in prayerful humility, will be taught of God, and will receive a knowledge of truth, and those who know the truth are forever free. The meek are the mighty. They are the ones, like Jesus Christ, who have learned to control their every vibration in a majesty of power so dynamic, they could rock the very earth with their continued silence, as they were mocked or tortured or slain. And their reactions to mockery or persecution, would have the power to silence their mockers bring their accusers to repentance or to even paralyze their persecutors, if so be they were led to use their accumulated powers in such a manner, but regardless of how they use the overwhelming strength of their controlled, righteous vibrations, they would themselves be masters, standing unharmed, uninjured, and divinely powerful as they would hold their silence, even as Christ did at his trial they would have the power to radiate only the glory of released love. And this is majesty, this is meekness, and such as these will be the inheritors of this earth when it is glorified. When the wicked, mayhap from the lowest depths of hell, which in itself is only a condition of burning regret, have paid the uttermost farthing of their debts to God and to humanity they will eventually be released to receive new opportunities, as they slowly evolve from their stations of remorse into new paths of progress. But, they can never, worlds without end, inherit the same degree of glory which the overcomers inherit, because without any delays or retardments to restrict them, the co with Christ go on without delays or restraints into the realm of Godhood and worlds without end, the others can never catch up, they may reach a high point of glory in the eternities, but always the overcomers will be far, far ahead. There is a law, irrevocable, decreed in heaven before the foundations of the world upon which all blessings are predicated, and when one receives a blessing from God, it must be upon obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. When one is rapt, even for a moment, in the sublime ecstasy of spiritual inspiration, he is lifted back into the Garden of Eden estate. This realm of contact with the holy, divine vibrating wonder, of the peace and power of God's enfolding love, is that realm out of which man was cast, because of transgression, the fruit of the tree of life, is in reality, the full essence of perfect divine love, it is the enfolding fullness of God's protection and approval, and joyous ecstasy, as it is expressed in the heart of man. It is the essence of everlasting life, it is the perfection of all that is, this entrance back into the Edenic estate is one that must be earned, desiring or believing one has received its gifts of life eternal is a condition of self-deception, brought on by that feeling of self-righteousness, which is an impossible condition to cope with, by the messengers of light. One must live the laws, he must perfect the gift of love right within himself, before the love of God can be shed forth through his heart, which is the gift of life, one must work upon himself, not so much upon others and when he has purified and perfected himself, and sanctified himself, then only, 
can others behold his light and be healed by the love that will pour forth from his being, and this will be a power so silent, and so love-filled, no words will be needed to testify of it, or of God. For my kingdom is not in word, but in power, saith the Lord. He that is slow to anger, is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit, than he that taketh a city. Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 32. Always, complete control and divine majesty, must be the manifest quality of each progressing soul. Each individual must be prepared, and instructed, in the strict discipline of himself. He must understand the necessity of majestic perfect control, and use the power within himself to rule over his own spirit, at all times. Otherwise, his works will profit him nothing, for they are but sounding brass, and clanging cymbals, which is but an unholy noise. It must be understood that each person must first prepare himself, purify himself sanctify himself, and perfect himself, before he is prepared to work upon others, this inner training, cannot be obtained in any college or school of divinity or monastery, as one crams his mind with facts and formulas, while his soul remains empty and unglorified, neither can such authority be assumed by any individual with the mere desire to become a servant in the hands of God, one must first learn to live the laws Christ gave. And Christ alone is the teacher, and the one who issues the sanction of approval upon those who enter his employ. As one works, upon himself instead of upon others, seeking to perfect the gift of love within himself, he truly begins to evolve from the man kingdom into the God kingdom as one's heart is generated by love, his being begins to change, his heart becomes softened and melted, and opens wide to the great and flowing love of God, then it is that he is offering to God the only approved sacrifice, the sacrifice of a broken or open heart and a contrite, humble, spirit, this is the only sacrifice acceptable since the Supreme One of the Son of God upon the cross. As one thus opens his heart, he is preparing himself to be taught of God. This very loving with all one's strength, is by the asking with all the energy of heart to be possessed of this love, and he who asks shall receive, for every one who asks receives. The noisy ones, with their sounding brass and their clanging cymbals, have never learned the divine majesty of spiritual control, or emotional stability in which all things become subject unto them, the life and the light, and the spirit, and finally the power, when they have proved themselves qualified and worthy to handle it. Those who go out of control, have never learned to love, for love itself is the fundamental element of divine control. The price required, is a dedicated desire that holds one's attention constantly upon the goal he yearns to reach. This concentration or dedication, is the pattern of fulfillment, it is the very seed that must grow and fulfill the thought pattern, or desire held forth. Every desire is a living seed, with the full potentials of complete realization when held as a vision in the mind of an individual. And now, to return to the full function of the Holy Helper, the Divine Comforter, that is given to abide in man, the abode of this glorious Helper is within the subconscious domain of man's mind, as the subconscious is renovated and cleansed, through the sustained exercise of learning to love God with all the mind. The wondrous helper is released from all negative, crowded, cramped, discordant functioning, as its powers are opened up for the use and perfecting of the individual. The powers of the holy helper, are so limitless, 
only miracles are released into the life of him who learns to draw upon its fabulous functioning, it never sleeps. It never tires. It never grows impatient. With its solicitous alertness, it seeks to fulfill every desire of man as it leads into all truth, solves every problem, and enlightens the mind to comprehend all things, and it is also the source of everlasting joy and glorious achievement. It is the great perfectionist, as it assists one to become perfect in every undertaking, as he lives the law of the angels. As one learns to open up first his mind, then his whole being, to this glorious companionship with this most gracious, divine helper, his joy increases until he grows into the fullness of joy, and there is no possible way to describe this glorious condition. One can only know and understand its breathtaking wonder, who prepares himself to experience it, with the subconscious mind renovated and cleansed and purified, through loving God with all the mind, the holy comforter is released from its tomb, or sepulchre, right within man. And with its release it becomes man's perfecting, success, glorifying joyous fulfilling mechanism of everlasting power, and its power is limitless. It is boundless. It is eternal. One must begin to contact the Holy Comforter, or Helper, through his own gift of vision, and his power to believe. This does not mean that he will necessarily behold the Holy Comforter with his physical eyes. This is not the pattern or plan of contact because this contact must be made through faith rather than through sight. The real contact, at first, is just that glorious all-over feeling of all-knowing, joyous ecstasy, and this contact is made by visualizing the goal one wishes to achieve or attain. One may advance until he has a mild mental vision of these divine higher goals, but until he begins to visualize himself as fulfilling them. He is seeing the promises afar off, and not preparing himself for full accomplishment. Each must visualize himself as fulfilling the promises, in the now. Live, always as though you had already fulfilled the dynamic promises of Almighty God. Live them, and you will know, and be, these promises. This is the law of fulfillment. This is the exercising of great and mighty faith. In this practice, the doubts and fears are automatically eliminated, as one begins to find the power and the strength of the Holy Helper, and grows into its constant fellowship. This sacred companionship becomes so real, and so exalting, and so glorious, that life has no meaning without it. It is joy and ecstasy and enlightenment, and the unfolding of the powers of Almighty God in the life of that individual. This very companionship is the divine contact with God the Father, and this contact and this constant awareness is the rightful heritage of everyone who will only learn to believe and accept it. The way of contact is the great love as one renovates his mind by the singing glory of inner praise, and loving devotion to God, for the continual assistance of this divine comforter, or holy helper. And with one's mind thus cleansed by the great love, he truly loves his neighbor, for no one could love God with all his mind and hold evil, resentful, hateful thoughts in his mind against anyone. He truly thinks only the most beautiful things possible, as his mind and lips lose the power to hurt and wound. And he, himself becomes as dynamically beautiful as his thoughts, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, in this renovating of the subconscious mind through love, the comforter or helper is released to assist and to bring its unspeakable powers of all fulfillment into the life of that individual. This must be thoroughly understood, 
that no idea or desire could possibly form in a human mind in the first place, if it were not possible. By learning to use the gift of visualization, which is hope itself in action, one begins to enter the ranks of the great ones, where doubts and negation are forever banished. In learning to associate with this divine holy helper, or comforter, one can learn to talk with it, as one man talks with another, then after one gives thanks and praise, and rejoices in that sacred fellowship, he can make his desire and hopes known, and he will be given the assurance of their fulfillment as he learns to listen, it is in the learning to listen that one will be directed into all happiness, and master every undertaking, and fulfill every promise. It the divine assistant, will unfold the way to master every requirement for complete and magnificent accomplishment, the very association with this powerful source of glory, is a joy forever. This light of Christ, is the voice of conscience. It is the Holy Spirit, or comforter, or guiding voice, or holy helper. Imagination, love and suggestions, are natural forces used in gaining the complete assistance of this glorious assistant, which helps accomplish all fulfillment. The only prerequisite in using suggestion, is the genuine desire to attain the goal one sets for himself along that joyous road of anticipation, and magnificent achievement. The released vibration of joyous ecstasy is the sunshine necessary for fulfilling the accomplishment, as the Holy Helper brings forth into the open, the request held out from within the secret closet of true prayer, of divine contact, for he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, abides under the shadow of the Almighty, where no evil or danger, or disappointments or distresses or disasters, can possibly touch him, this divine power of cooperation with the Holy Helper, quickly becomes apparent when it is coupled with joyous enthusiasm, and gratitude, with man's released thanks, it then becomes a tremendous, undeniable force of triumphant glorious help. There are two methods by which one can use this divine and holy law of fulfillment and no one can apply either without being benefited and eventually quickened, one way is to go into your secret closet, or closing the door or conscious mind to all outside activities and distractions, talk to the Father, who seeth in secret, and he will reward you openly, or bring into tangible undeniable reality, the answer to your request, this is one way. The other way, is to be used as one goes to sleep at night, as the mind changes shifts from the conscious to the unconscious, between waking and sleeping, the conscious messages can best be relayed to the divine helper, this is the best method that can be used by a beginner, or until that divine companionship is fully established, in this brief period of transition from waking to sleeping, it is most easy to transplant the desires through mental visioning into the subconscious, or into the fulfilling power of the divine holy helper, for he doeth the works, and will work out the glory of its full manifestation, these two methods are in reality one and the same thing, the only requisite is that the desiring or request must be sincere, and all haggling and all doubting must be absent. The most glorious, and powerful of all desires, is to request that the gift of perfect love become completely established in you, even that you might become that divine holy love, of mercy and compassion, and healing perfecting glory. With this gift established all else will be added, this is the fullness of the kingdom of heaven within, and when one actually becomes that love, he will automatically be born of the Spirit, which alone holds the keys and powers of full service, and eternal joy, along with the power to be able to do the greater works, 
Within this gift of perfect love is the power to overcome all things, even death. It also contains the glorious accomplishment to be ordained of God, so that all things will become subject unto that individual. Know the truth, and the truth will make you free, and he who is free shall be free indeed. What is truth? If the divine comforter has been given to abide in man, and if it is also the spirit of truth, or the light of Christ, and leads into all truth, then the answer, and the fulfilling of that sacred promise, lies in receiving the divine contact with the most wonderful comforter, that holy spirit of promise, the divine helper. It knows truth, its mission is to lead man into all truth. Each individual is to be tested and tried in all things. But be not dismayed or afraid, each testing is a glory, and brings its own rewards, when you can hold every vibration in exulting praise and rejoicing, no matter what comes or goes in your life, you have achieved the perfect control so that no negative, doubtful vibrations can possibly be dropped into your subconscious realm, then you have become a master, and since it is within that subconscious mind, that is the abode or cradle of that beloved comforter, the divine helper, that little child that must be loved with such tender, careful consideration and care, in order for it to grow and mature until one's being is filled with its power and glory, it must be guarded. It is to be forever protected from the refuse and swill of one's evil discordant, negative vibrations of wrath and jealousies, and doubts and fears, and evil reactions. It must be held in love, and surrounded always in joy and gladness, and faith, and confidence, and such infinite tenderness. Yes. It must be loved as a little child. But those whose eyes become single to the glory of God will be filled with light, and there will be no darkness in them, and they will comprehend all things. In other words, they will know the truth. These are the ones whose eyes are truly single to the glory of God, and are not upon their own imagined importance, or on half-truths, or perhaps in truths. Ask, seek and knock and God's promise is that everyone, regardless of his background, mistakes, race, color or creed, shall receive, everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks shall find, truth, and unto him who knocks it shall be opened, and, those who go to men for their information and answers, instead of to God, are trusting in the arm of flesh, they who have received momentary nourishment as they have been touched by inspiration, as God has fed them a small serving of his Holy Spirit, hoping to prepare them for the fullness of life so that they could, in time, mature into their own perfection and be born of the Spirit, have so often failed to use that divine nourishment righteously, instead of using that glorious portion of spiritual ecstasy as the divine substance on which they could grow into perfection, they have failed to assimilate its power, and have immediately spewed it out in unseemly behavior, as they have defiled the banquet tables of their Lord with their vomit, as Isaiah proclaimed. The false idea and teaching, that God and Christ are one identical being, is disproved by the scriptures in so many different passages and there is nothing in all the scriptures, to verify the erroneous belief that man, is God. They were called gods, unto whom the word of God came, this scripture does not say that they, were God. And the infant in its crib, can become a man, even as a father is a man. An infant does not, become his father, the holy place of the Most High is a spiritual navel, this contact point with the umbilical cord, is the condition or accomplishment where one receives the benediction and the blessing, 
of that Holy Spirit of promise, as it promises that the perfection desired, and the complete fulfillment, for which the soul so earnestly yearns, will be reached. It is also the place where one is enfolded in the peace that passeth understanding, or which goes beyond the physical, mortal mind to comprehend, as that individual develops into a prince of peace. Let no man deceive you, give ear, to God alone, for he will be your teacher and you will need none to teach you. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Anyone who truly loves God, will assuredly seek to fulfill and to perfect, that first and great commandment of complete devotion, this is the love that has nothing to do with the teaching of men, or with the fears that man's inadequate teachings have fostered, this is the love that is complete, the love that has put aside self, and its proud, hypocritical, outside services of display lip service and emotionalism, this is the love that desires only to give, instead of seeking only to receive credits and honors, this is the type of love that can glorify God in all conditions, tribulations and hazards, it is the love that is not seeking for a sugar daddy to listen to its whimpering complaints, selfish demands or unreasonable requests which individuals have not prepared themselves to receive, those filled with perfected love, are the ones who can rejoice in all things, in pain, in seeming misfortunes, in anguish or sorrow, and relinquishing these harassments unto the Lord, glorify His name and rejoice forevermore, as they themselves become glorified. These are the ones who can truly transmute any condition in existence, by their attitude of praising gratitude. And in fulfilling this powerful privilege, they themselves will become translated beings, born of the Spirit. In the fifteenth chapter of St. John is stressed several times, the glorious truth that Christ himself is the vine, and that without that contact with the vine, Man can produce no fruit, or accomplish no good, but is destined to become withered and useless, and worthy only to be cut off and cast in the fire. For the word, or that inner instruction, of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ and the Spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world. And the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world, that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit, and every one that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit cometh unto God, even the Father. Nothing could be plainer than this, and there is nothing more beautiful, or more gratifying to the soul. The Great Key and the lock and the door, have always been right within the reach of every man's hand, it has been as close to him as his navel and as unnoticed, this holy contact with the divine supply of continual spiritual nourishment is given freely, until that which is perfect is come, or is developed and brought forth, this glory and fulfillment are awaiting those who realize they do not already know everything or possess all knowledge, or have all power, and through this acknowledgement, grow humble, so that they can begin to ask, to seek and to knock, so that they can be taught of God, in a new childlike humility, it is as one seeks that holy kingdom of God, or divine contact with God within, that his faith turns into knowing and his knowing turns to power, it is in this contact or center, this kingdom of heaven within, that one learns to fulfill all the laws of righteousness, he learns to be still and to actually know God. In this contact only, can one receive the fullness of joy, which belongs to the saints alone. This ecstasy, is at first given in just small measured portions, this is how and why one only receives those ecstatic, spiritual thrills occasionally at first, that is, 
until he learns to control them and to hold himself in holy majesty. It must be noted here, the boundless effort that is required to learn to control and to manipulate a small, infant body. It takes two full years, plus childhood, and often all the years of adolescence to learn to master the physical body, the spiritual body, as it develops, requires time also to be brought into perfect control as one learns to glorify the emotional system. It takes time and desiring to bring the spiritual emotional being into the maturity of divine majestic, regal nobility, of glorious mastery. That inner center within man's own soul is the secret closet in which one can close the door to all outside negation and discords and disturbances and actually converse with God and receive answers. This has been known as walking with God. It is the developed ability to associate with the divine and those who learn to make this contact have truly found the kingdom of heaven within in which all else is added. As one makes this contact all negation and evils and anguish, and mortal worries and turmoils are left behind, they are dissolved by the light and the glory of God, the love toward God is not taught by the precepts of men. This divine, perfect love is taught by the Spirit of God, as individuals lift up their hearts to worship and adore. It is brought forth as one learns to sing that new song, of praise and love and gratitude, which none but the righteous can learn. This song will open the doors to the kingdom of heaven within. It will lead one to the complete fulfilling of that first and great commandment. The spirit of revelation is in connection with these blessings. A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation, for instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, it may give you sudden strokes of ideas, so that by noticing it, you find it fulfilled the same day or soon. That is, those things that were presented unto your minds by the spirit of God, will, come to pass and thus by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation, until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. This very Spirit of revelation, is the ability to receive the Word of God as it is given to you personally, from the Almighty. As one grows into this marvel of revealing, it does not necessarily entitle him to the right to go out shouting it to the world. Such behavior, when encouraged or uncontrolled, often leads one into false prophesying and exhibitionism, and evil, and this will close securely the channel of increasing direction from the Heavenly Father. One's growth, and perfecting, ends with his own yielding to his inclination to display the self. When the spirit of revelation does come, it is but the witness of that contact and association with God, and it is for one's own personal growth, at first, in time that individual may be called to share such holy messages or teachings, but only after he is ordained of God and sent forth to become the humble servant, even the very least in the hands of the Almighty with the self completely crucified or put aside, as long as there are those who display only the gifts of the Spirit, and none of the fruits, then you may know with a sure knowing that love has not yet been made perfect in their lives. Man uses the gifts unintentionally perhaps, to bear witness of himself, though in his blindness he believes he is bearing witness of God but the gifts used thus will profit him nothing. And by the great love, or by the fruits thereof, shall you be known, for love only brings the fulfillment of that which is perfect. When love is perfected in any individual, he will truly be born of the Spirit, and he will comprehend all things, fully and completely, not just in part. And now, 
I am ending the narration of Annalise Caron's words from her amazing book, Beyond Mortal Boundaries. But, there is so much more to her book, these are simply the highlights I have marked in her book from the beginning to the end. I would encourage you to search the internet for all of her books, and read them starting with the book, Year Gods, or perhaps with the little book by Christine Mercy called, Sons of God. And before I go, I want to tell you this. I love you. You are wonderful. You are amazing. You are beautiful. You were created in the image of the all. Mighty, God.